let's start talking about troubleshooting. Let's talk about troubleshooting and maintenance and remote data gathering and an introduction to some graphical troubleshooting tools. Starting out with troubleshooting and maintenance, now we're going to do a quick review of the OSI model and we'll get on to troubleshooting methodologies and routine maintenance tasks. Of course, this is the last class of CCNP. It's assumed that you're already very comfortable with all the topics of CCNA and route and switch. So we're not going to spend a lot of time reteaching those subjects, but we will brush up just to remind ourselves. Starting with the OSI model, of course, we know that this is the conceptual model. We use it not only to help troubleshoot, but also vendors who develop products. They focus their attention on one or several layers. We know that each of the layers has to only speak to the immediate layer above or below it. Real quick review, something that you should very well know from CCNA. The uh, OS, uh, layer seven, the application layer here, is basically a customer service counter where an application, such as a browser, which has no clue how to get on a network, asks the operating system for help. And how does it do it? It speaks a language. It speaks a layer seven protocol, like HTTP or HTTPS, or FTP or SMB or SNMP or DNS, DHCP. Take your pick, the list goes on and on. We know that the next one, presentation layer, layer six, this is how both sides will agree upon a common data format. And so if you've ever opened a browser and you got this prompt saying you need the Flash plugin to watch this something something video, you were seeing layer six, presentation layer in action. Or if you have ever gone shopping online and then you click proceed to checkout and you see the protocol change to HTTPS in the little lock down here, that's calling SSL which is layer six again. So we have all the multimedia formats, all the codecs, all the uh, character sets, the encryption, the compression, all of those, of course, at layer six. Layer five down here, session layer. This is where the two endpoints start to have a sense of each other and have a sense of the fact that they're on a network. There are many ways to distinguish a session with layer five, but the one we focus on is the use of ports. So source and destination both have their own port and it takes a port and a protocol and an IP address to create a socket, to create an actual unique connection. So with session layer, I have a port, you have a port. Some ports are well known as we know. Some ports are registered by applications. Then some ports are free for all, dynamic. A browser opens, OS gives it whatever is available. Transport layer. Here at layer four, this is the pivotal layer. This is the layer that abstracts the mechanical part of the network from the upper parts. Here's where we actually establish and tear down a session. So we know in TCP IP, the two main protocols that live here are TCP and its little brother UDP. There are of course many other layer four protocols, but we're focusing on the TCP IP model, which of course is actually not the OSI model, but it maps to it and uh, we're quite aware of that. So at the transport layer, if we are going reliable, such as with TCP, we establish a session with a three-way handshake that sets our starting sequence numbers. And then from there, we can proceed and we get acknowledgements periodically. I send packet one, two, three. Actually, it would be TCP segment one, two, three. You acknowledge back four. I send four, five, six. You acknowledge back seven, etc. If you acknowledge back a different number, I know to pick it up from that point. When we're done, TCP four-way goodbye handshake. So here we are actually creating the mechanical part of the connection here taking a big data stream, breaking it up into small segments, or if it's UDP, UDP datagrams for transmission across the network. Now, of course, UDP doesn't break things up the way TCP does. UDP expects the application to do that for it. Now, at layer three, we're down to the real mechanical part here where we are putting a logical address on a packet and we're finding the best route. And of course, what lives here at layer three? IP its friend ICMP, and if you are managing multicasting, IGMP. So we have 
layer three, where we're actually getting this stuff ready for shipment. And then finally, down at the data link layer, here's where we are preparing the packet, now called a frame, for whatever is appropriate for the transmission media. So now we've got to take an IP packet, put it inside of an Ethernet frame because we're transmitting on Ethernet, or putting it inside of a frame relay frame because we're transmitting on frame relay, or et cetera, et cetera. So here is where we are actually preparing the thing really to go on the physical media. Of course, the data link layer has two parts, the uh, LLC, logical link control, and the MAC, media access control. The bottom line is LLC's job is to basically identify what the layer three payload is. The max sublayer's job is to put a physical address on. And then finally, down here at the physical layer, this is where we're transmitting ones and zeros. And that's where we have all the cabling, all the connectors, frequencies, clock rates, voltages, baseband, broadband, modulation types, uh, whether it's radio, wireless, this, that, or the other, or whether it's wired, it's fiber optic, um, uh, the uh, light frequencies, etc. That is down at the physical layer. If you need to review the OSI model, I recommend you go back to the CCNA class to do that. So let's talk about some popular troubleshooting methodologies. You do need to be aware of these. There are a number of them. We have something that's very simple, the simplified one. We'll see that in a moment. We have from the top down or the bottom up, and we are talking OSI model. Starting at layer seven, working our way down, or starting at layer one, working our way up. Or something that we tend to do very frequently is good old divide and conquer usually starting at layer three and then working in either direction. Most of us start out with, can I ping this thing? And so that's, that's of course, a layer three uh, activity. Ping itself is an application, but it uses ICMP, which is at layer three, right? Another one we do frequently is to follow the traffic path. Now, we're going to do a whole lot of troubleshooting in this class, and we'll use a lot of follow the traffic path, see where it stops. We'll ping, we'll trace, uh, and we'll just we'll also look at diagrams and see where is this supposed to go. We can also, if you need to just check something quickly, we can compare configurations. So for example, if you have two routers creating a VPN between them, or you have two switches creating a, a, a trunk link, or maybe an ether channel um, port between them, a link between them, if it's not working, if the tunnel's not up, if the, the, the channel isn't up, if the, the whatever, the trunk isn't trunking, um, we can very quickly look at the two ends and compare to see if they're compatible. So we can compare configurations. Or sometimes we can compare what's running versus what's in start. And then there's good old component swapping. Let's just swap out a cable. Let's swap out a switch if we have to. Let's swap out something just to very quickly uh, narrow down the problem on a physical level. So the simplified troubleshooting methodology has three steps right here. Problem report, problem diagnosis, and problem resolution. Please remember those three steps. Susie Q has reported a problem. We actually verify and diagnose it, and from there we try to resolve three steps. We can see with the top-down troubleshooting that we would start at a higher layer in the OSI model and we'd work our way down to a lower one, such as let's start with the browser and see what the browser can do and then work our way down. Or from the bottom, let's see if we have a link light and from there, let's go on up. Or divide and conquer, very typically we'll start at layer three. Can we ping or can we trace uh, to some destination? Following the, path, uh, the traffic path troubleshooting, very, very common. Let's see if we can get to the switch. Let's see if we can get to the router. Let's see if we can get beyond the router. Let's see if we can get to uh, the destination at the far end. Or comparing configurations. If we look here, I'll just take a quick look. We can see, and I'm going to zoom in just a bit so we can see this. We can see if we look here that this is our running config on a router, and if we scroll down, we can see that int FA00 has an IP address of 
1.254 with a slash 24 mask. And the duplex and speed are set to auto. When we come over here and we see what's in start, the same router, we can see that start says this IP should be 192.168.1.1. Uh-huh. So it looks like someone changed the IP address while it was running without saving it to startup config. So there's an example there. We'll see plenty of examples of comparing configs when we take a look at Ether Channel and VPNs and the like. Or just let's flat out swap components just really quickly. Let's just try a cable, try a different switch port, try a different end device like a different laptop, try a different switch. So we can swap out things as well. All of these methods are ways of very quickly narrowing down the problem. Now something you really need to be aware of is having a structured methodology for troubleshooting. You know, I can tell you so many times I've seen junior engineers and junior network administrators, they just try things shotgun. They'll try five different things. It suddenly works. They don't know which one did it. You don't want to be doing that. Um, I mean, you, you might want to try a few things, but at some point you need to discover what was the real solution. Now, in real life, chances are excellent the real solution has already been done and just the configuration or uh, the, the performance of the hardware, it drifted, something broke, something changed. And um, the solution that you're going to implement has probably already been done already. If not in your own environment by you, then by somebody. Very rarely, actually, is there a problem that nobody has ever looked at before. I mean, that does happen. It will happen to you. But uh, that's not an everyday occurrence. If it seems like we've never encountered this before, it's because it's not happened in your environment yet. Chances are outstanding it's happened in someone's environment. So let's make sure we know these stages. We start out with the problem report. We need to actually know that there's a problem. And of course, we know with problem report, what do we hear from users? It doesn't work. Well, we need to do better than that. The next thing we need to do is collect information. What do you mean it doesn't work? Well, I can't get to the website. I hear this one all the time. We've lost the internet. No, I can ping and you can get email. We haven't lost the internet. Or you can Skype or you can do whatever. Instead, we have a problem with, say, your browser. So when we collect information, we're trying to do detective work, gather as much info as we can so that we have everything just laid out and we can look at it and analyze it. So when we collect information, we're trying to uh, find out what really does work, what really does not work, did it work before, what has changed. Now, of course, if you've ever dealt with users, they get all defensive and difficult because they're afraid that you're somehow accusing them. And, and so there's a sort of a skill to gathering information. Get them to think that they're helping you in this detective work. That, that kind of helps break the ice. After we've hopefully gathered all the relevant information, and quite frankly, we very frequently have to go back and get more info, we will examine the information, examine what we have, and then from there, we'll try to eliminate potential causes. So if we can ping, it's not going to be a cable, right? So I mean, that's where the divide and conquer and uh, doing whole sort of sections helps to uh, narrow this down. Then once we've narrowed down to a list of candidates, we'll propose a hypothesis. Well, OK, we can ping but we still can't open a browser. Well, what, or we can't have a browser go to the web server. Well, what are all the possible reasons why we could ping the web server but not open a browser to it? Well, it could be the server service. It could be the web page itself. It could be the browser. It could be a proxy configuration. It could be that uh, we've got an ACL somewhere. It could be uh, that we've got some firewall blocking something. So we, we've got this list of possibilities. So we propose what we think was the most likely hypothesis, and very often it's what has happened before. And then we'll verify, we'll, we'll test our hypothesis. And this is where you check one thing. Was the problem solved? No. Go back again. If it was not solved, either try another one, try the next thing on your list, verify it, and, and keep going round and round. Or if you have to, 
go back to your information. Or if you really have to, go get more information. That, that happens all the time. And if it was solved, when we finally find the thing that does solve it, yes, then we have problem resolution. Now, of course, if you've worked in Help Desk, you, you know this. Problem resolution means that I go to Suzy Q and I say, please try this. Do what you normally do. Is everything as it should be? So we won't make assumptions on what we think is right because the user, the, the, the initial problem may still mask other problems. So we want to make sure that it's all working for the user. Because the bottom line, you know, the business is IT, IT is the business. The bottom line is business runs on IT. And everything we do has to make the people who actually make money for the business, which is not us, who are spending money on the business, uh, the folks who are actually making the money and bringing in, um, bringing in all the, uh, uh, the revenue and the ones who are productive in that regard, we need to make their lives as easy as possible so they can rake in the dough, so that they can basically have the network, which keeps us employed. So as you're collecting information, three categories. There is the troubleshooting information. And you collect this while you're troubleshooting an issue that was either reported by a user or by a network management station. Say um, you've got uh, an SNMP manager, or you've got solar winds, or you've got whatever you've got. And uh, either way, you've collected some information while you're troubleshooting. There's also baseline information. Now, in this case, the network is operating normally. But we want to gather a baseline so that we can see the performance trends and we can see performance drift. Because networks, unless the business is going out of business, networks never get smaller. They always grow. They grow in um, capacity or in what, what they have to do. They grow in utilization. They grow in the number of protocols that go across it. They grow in the number of users that log on. So we want to collect a baseline when the network is operating normally, and this gives us a frame of reference that we can compare other data to when we're troubleshooting. So we can say, well, that's happening, that's not normal. Or, yeah, that is normal. Or we can also have network event information collection. So devices will automatically generate alerts in response to something happening, some kind of condition, like maybe the switch will hit some uh, utilization level, or the router will hit some utilization level, or a server will hit some kind of utilization threshold. And so when those happen, some kind of network event is generated. These can be just notifications, or they can be emergency messages. In SNMP, we call them traps. So starting with the problem statement, so remember, we have this problem report here. So let's start with a problem statement. We need the problem to be as specific and relevant as possible. Now, in the very beginning, when Susie Q says, I can't get on the network, her problem report will probably be very vague. It will just be what she perceives, or it'll be very narrow, or she'll start saying all kinds of things that aren't relevant. So with that, we have to collect information so that we can make the problem statement as specific and as relevant as possible. And so we have some examples here, different problem statements. Let's compare them, and we can see which one is the most useful. From a networking perspective, this first statement will be the most useful. Now, from a help desk perspective, when you're dealing with uh, desktop operating systems, maybe something else is more useful. But from a network perspective, it gives us the most information to say that user A is unable to connect to this resource, 10.1.1.1 uh, backslash share. The first thing this tells me is that this is a Microsoft share in the way it's written, and so that they're going to be using a CIFS or SMB as a layer 7 protocol. And it begs the question to me of, OK, if you can't connect to that resource, what can you connect to? That's far better than saying, the network is broken, or user A cannot reach the network. Well, is that true? No, it's much more specific to say, user A can't get to that share. Or user A or user B recently changed their PC operating system to Windows 7. From a networking perspective, that 
Well, we might say, okay, did they somebody set a firewall, a software firewall? From a networking perspective, that's not so important to us. The next thing we need to be aware of is well-known maintenance models. You will be expected to know this. So there are several of them. There's first of all FCAPs. Now FCAPs stands for Fault Management, Configuration Management, Accounting Management, Performance Management, and Security Management. That's where we get this acronym FCAPs. This is a standard maintenance model. It was defined by the ISO, by the, ISO the uh, International Standards Organization, or the International Organization for Standards. There's another one, ITIL, the IT Infrastructure Library. Probably already familiar with this one. This is best practice recommendations that work together to meet IT business management goals. So ITIL is for IT management, FCAPS, is so that we can have the fault configuration, accounting, performance, and security. There's also TMC, Telecommunications Management Network. And this is um, something that the ITU created. Uh, it's a variation of FCAPS. And the ITU, of course, is the International Telecommunications un Union. And this is their standardization sector that created that. So this targets management specifically of telecommunications networks, which of course in these days of convergence and um, uh, basically when you have um, voice and video on your network, not separate, um, in these days the network engineer has to know a lot about telecommunications as well. There's also Cisco Lifecycle Services. And this is the distinct phases in the life of a Cisco technology in a network. And the phases are prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. We often call it the PPDIOO model, or the PPDIO model. And so please be aware of these well-known maintenance models. As you're managing your network, you're going to have routine maintenance tasks. You'll have ru routine tasks for just changing configurations. You'll change the network. Users will change where they're sitting. They'll change location. You'll need to allow access for guest users. So these are all things that might fall under configuration change. We'll also routinely replace hardware. We're either upgrading or something breaks or something's starting to act a little flaky. So we could have older hardware that needs to be replaced or we'll have production hardware that fails. We'll also routinely do backups. Now, when you think backup, don't just think um, you know, like a Windows Server operating system that we're backing up. Here, we're also backing up our switches and our routers. Now, you might say, that's kind of silly. We, we don't really back up whole OSs. We back up the configuration files, don't we? Because if you have a major network outage and you, like, let's say, I, I, I've had this happen um, when I was working overseas. Um, we're in a, an area where, the, uh, the, frankly, the power grid's not very good. And, I mean, even in the United States, on our power grid, we have a voltage transients that fly to 30,000 volts. But they're, they're very, very short. And usually surge protectors suppress those, and UPSs suppress those. But um, in other countries where the power grid is not nearly so well managed as in, say, the United States, um, the voltage is terrible. Not good sur surge suppression. And so I've seen lightning strikes that just send huge spikes on a, uh, a power grid and just blow things up. I mean, completely wipe out stuff. So now we've got to replace whole gobs of equipment. Well, that's not that big a deal. OK, so we order the equipment, fine. I mean, it hurts our pocketbook, but whatever. Um, and we've got, we can always get the iOS again. We can drop that on in case we need to put in an updated version of the iOS. But what about all your configs? What about all those VLANs that you had configured and all those ACLs that you had configured and all those sub-interfaces? That's the part I'm talking about when I talk about backing up. We need to back up our configurations. And so we'll have scheduled backups saving the running config. And of course, don't simply save it to start. 
don't simply save it to Flash. Yes, save it to Flash, of course, but also save it somewhere else where you have it handy. This allows us to recover from network problems when we have failing switches and routers. We will have regular software updates. I mean, even Cisco equipment has been shown in the past number of years to be subject to um, hacking and um, denial of service and um, uh, memory leaks and things like that. Cisco doesn't put out patches the way, say, Microsoft does. We already know that. Instead, you download a whole new version of the iOS that's the, the latest version, and you replace your old iOS with the new iOS, and you apply your uh, config file to it. So we'll have security updates. We'll have bug fixes. We will also regularly monitor the network. If you're not monitoring your network, you're either a very, very tiny shop or you're getting ready to polish up your resume. You have to monitor your network. You have to understand the traffic statistics, understand bandwidth utilization. You have to look for the bottlenecks, try to identify the problems before they happen as much as we can. Be as proactive. Planning for future growth. I mean, <laughs> managers can deal with if you say, well, at the rate we're going in six months' time, we'll probably need to buy or update or something. They can handle that. They can put that in their budget. What they don't appreciate, of course, is, oh, gee, this thing suddenly can't, can't deal with the traffic we have. Oh, well, we better buy another switch. They haven't planned that out in their budget. So give them as much warning as possible. Now, let's talk about configuration templates. If you say to one of your net admins, go and secure the switch, they will think one thing, and another net admin will think another thing, and another net admin will think another thing. Tell 10 different people to secure the switch, you'll probably have 10 different configs. What you are going to want to do is have templates for common things, templates for even simple things like creating VLANs, where you have common naming conventions. You want to have templates so that everybody understands for something commonplace a, a, a typical configuration that we would do, creating port channels, um, creating ACLs, creating this, or whatever. We want to have a standardized template, and, you, and then you just change the values. This way, when you say, go secure a switch, they know to use template something which will put port security on, Mac sticky, um, will turn off unnecessary services, et cetera, and uh, done in a way that everyone agrees, or if you're the senior engineer, the way you say so. And of course, you should follow best practice. In CCNA, you studied a fair amount about best practice for securing devices. So we want to use templates for those common configs. We want to reduce the risk of ambiguity or inconsistency when we're implementing some kind of required change. The next thing we're going to talk about is iOS troubleshooting commands. Start with new learning now.